Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. Uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful day here in Washington, D.C., and our guest today is Andy Riker, who's the executive director of UHAB, and he's a 2021 Cooperative Hall of Fame inductee. Good morning, Andy. Good morning. And you're in New York. How is everything in New York this morning? It's getting to be a very hot day. Hot and steamy. Hot and steamy. Um, you guys in Washington are used to that. But yes, yes. Here in New York, we're only partially used to it. Thank you for being on this morning, and congratulations for your induction into the Cooperative Hall of Fame. Thank you. I've been for maybe the last 10 years on the selection committee, and I was so pleased to see your name brought forth. And so pleased to see that you were inducted in. The, the selection committee was like really looking at your career, and it was an easy sort of decision to induct you into the Hall of Fame with all you've done. So this morning, I would like to talk about some of the things you've accomplished in your career. It, it, it says that your whole career you've been doing this work of improving people's lives, getting them to go out of poverty through Stable and affordable housing. What does that mean and what is that about? Well, I think something that we've learned over the years that it's really hard for people to sort of advance in their lives to, you know, get up and out of the conditions that they're in if they don't have a stable place to live. So, so it is one of the foundational parts of, of, you know, improving people's lives. So. Um, it's been important, and that's one of the gratifying things about working in housing. It, it really does have a very impactful and, and visibly impactful change in people's lives when they have stable, affordable, decent housing, and then can get on with the other things in their lives. That fact has been considered one of the determinants of good health or poor health. If you have stable housing, you have a chance of having good health. If you don't have it, there's a higher risk of your having poor health, physical health, emotional right. health. Yeah, it's big. Right. In there. I, I think kids who live in stable housing do better in school. Yes. Uh, you know, I think. But the added benefit to me of, of um, creating co-op housing is sort of the community. That's sort of our tagline at, at UHAB is uh, creating community through cooperation. And uh, community adds so much more to people's lives, really makes the things that people need to do easier, provides supports, it provides guidance, it provides people with experience, are part of your community. As simple as someone to, you know, watch the kids when they get home from school while you're still at work it can make a real big difference in in someone's life so community is an important part of co-op housing so it takes a community to raise a child it takes a village to <laughs> raise a child or african saying it takes a community for good health it takes community to survive and strive all of all of that so yes yep. so you have has it you're building community through cooperation yes that's our goal I got it. I heard Keith Ellis, Congressman Keith Ellis, um, Minnesota or Wisconsin at the time, he said that a house is to a family what a bowl is to baking a cake. And I remember that, and it's interesting. He said, have you ever tried to bake a cake without a bowl? You crack two eggs and you it splash all over the counter. You put some flour on it. You put some sugar. You put vanilla. You put... And what do you have? 
What do you have if you bake a cake like that, Andy? Yeah, <laughs> what you, you have, have a mess. A mess. You have a mess. And the whole audience <laughs> said that you have a mess. He said it's right. the same thing. If you have, if a family does not have a home, you end up with a mess. Kids right. don't have right. a place to study, like you talked about. There's no place to share things. There's no safety net, and uh, kids don't have a place to come to after school. I don't, on and on and on and on. And you end up with a mess. So, yeah, what you've been doing in New York for 40-plus years is making sure there's no mess or less of a mess, if you will. And yeah. I thank you for that. And you are one of my heroes. I really well, appreciate thank you. Because I learned about co-ops through managing affordable housing co-ops in, here in D.C. and fell in love with this model because I saw everyday people sometimes that best of high school education make really informed decisions. They didn't need an MBA or a college degree. They learned. The study groups of co-ops is constantly training, constantly learning, and they learn how to make informed collective decisions. And they really, really work when they work. So, yes, and you've been doing it in New York. About how many buildings have you and you have done over the years? We've worked with with about 1,500 buildings, which make up about 1,300 co-ops. There's about 30,000 households, families that live in these live in these buildings. They're spread throughout the city, but uh, primarily where the city had abandoned buildings in the in the earlier days, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, where abandonment was rampant. That's where most of our housing is. In a recent show that was done from our archives, the uh, researchers actually imposed our map of our buildings over the redlining maps of uh, New York City from the 30s and 40s. And it's, you know, as, as should have been expected, but still surprising, they line up really well. And which tells you a lot about the neighborhoods in which this housing is and 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 then the opportunities to really rebuild these neighborhoods, you know, bring them back and take control. I mean, the nice thing about a co-op is you not only are living there, but you control it. And so as it improves, you don't get displaced. Um, you get to take advantage of the improvements and and have a voice in, in how the neighborhood changes. So that's important in the pandemic. Those maps, the redlining maps, also lined up with some of the the most affected neighborhoods in the in the pandemic as well. So uh, you know, history history is still playing out in in New York City's neighborhoods, and I'm sure it's true all over the country. So let me make sure I got it right. You've got you take a map and you look at redlining, and redlining was. Uh, banks do not loan money to these folks in this district and this redlining. And those districts were mostly black and brown people. Right. Okay. Right. So it was it was discrimination in this area. Was there and, any other definition of redlining? What did redlining mean? Well, redlining were said to, these are are you know it was a sort of a more general warning. These are bad neighborhoods. Don't invest. So insurance was difficult. Borrowing, lending was difficult. Also, it was where uh, you know families were steered to and. It, according to those redlining. So black but families, then, black and brown families were steered families, to these groups. These to groups. the to the neighborhoods. Yeah. And so then when abandonment started, it, it it was in those neighborhoods where landlords were abandoning the the housing. That's where those were the low income neighborhoods. So when the city took title to abandoned buildings, those became sort of the resources, the available buildings that you have and our founders actually at you have saw these abandoned city owned buildings that were available um, as a as an opportunity to build, you know, for people to build their own housing, to own their own housing, to take control and and control their own housing. And that the folks who were in those neighborhoods and were trying to stay in those neighborhoods were the other part of the formula that, as you know, you observed a little earlier, families who've lived through these really difficult conditions have seen landlords practicing bad management, have had you know a negative lesson, but but have had a lesson and know a lot 
about what housing and how it's run and how it can go bad, but also how it could be good. And actually, when they come together, can really run a co-op really well and really understand what goes into making a, a building, you know, a home, a, a good place to live. And so it's worked well. And, you know, although we get, you know, credit or, you know, people like to say, and we like to say, uh, you know, how many units, how many buildings, there are, you know, 1,300 boards of directors out there. They may have six, eight, ten people. There are thousands and thousands of of you know, co-op leaders and then the regular residents who who pitch in, who do their part, who pay their monthly charges, who, you know, come out for the meetings or go to the, you know, uh, cleanup days or, you know, go to work on the when a new roof needs to go on or something. You know, sometimes buildings do it. And that that's you have early history was self-help, was helping groups of people take over vacant, abandoned buildings and fix them up with their own sweat equity. My predecessors in this job uh, claim to have invented the word sweat equity, and and I, I think it might be true. You know, you said a lot, and we're going to take our first break here, and just really quickly is redlining I got is where we ended up with the ghetto. And as buildings deteriorated because there were some landlords they abandoned these buildings. There was a lot of problems in these neighborhoods. And you said when COVID hit, you could also see it that COVID hit hardest in these buildings because the blacks and browns had pre-existing conditions and they had to work in areas. They could not stop working. So we'll be right back. We're going to talk more to Andy Riker about his 40 plus years of helping create stable housing and communities. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Mr. Andrew Riker, better known as Andy, uh, from New York City. And as he said it, to within the first segment, they have about 1,500 uh, properties, 1,300 of them are co-ops, about 30,000 households in these co-op buildings, there's 30,000 board of directors in these co-op buildings, and a bunch of family members, family households. And Andy, when I have it, because I learned about co-ops because I managed co-ops here in D.C. and affordable housing co-ops and fell in love with them because everyday people made decisions and extremely good decisions, these board of directors. And what it took for to start a, a good co-op was an engaged membership. Those people that live in that co-op, those 30,000 households, the more successful the building community is depends on how engaged the members are, how much training they're taking, whether they come out and do the cleanup days that you talked about, whether they come to the annual meetings. In some co-ops, they, they allow members to come to every board meeting. And the more members came to those board meetings, holding the, the board uh, responsible and accountable and then the board holding management whomever is managing accountable those work best and they were the most successful ones and you talked about in redlining through history they didn't uh, buildings and, and people that own housing and redlining didn't get insurance they didn't get mortgages they couldn't borrow we called them the ghetto and it was often that they got bad press and whenever Harlem started changing and gentrification came in or U Street, 14th and U in D.C., this gentrification came, the price of housing shot up and then black folks had to move out because they could not afford the taxes and then the insurance and the other things that go along and then fixing up so they end up moving out. So what has been your experience with, particularly in the last 20 years, these buildings as the price of insurance, property taxes have gone up. How have these communities survived or stayed alive? Well, one is that, that these buildings are owned and managed by the people who live there, so they aren't 
being pushed out. So then the issues that you raise are important ones. Insurance is an important cost, and it's one of the things we recognized early on. So we actually have a group insurance policy for about half of our buildings. And so we're able to, uh, particularly in the neighborhoods that generally would see high insurance rates, to be able to moderate those rates, um, provide quality insurance at at very competitive uh, prices. So that's one thing that we've worked well, let me on. Make sure I understand this. You have have you in, have you have your own insurance pool, or you work with an insurance we have, carrier? Too? We have our own insurance pool. At one point, we actually did create an insurance company, co-op insurance company, one of the first ones to be done since probably the 1880s in New York State. Uh, but we were unable to actually sort of go into the market because we did it just as in 2008, just as the economy, um, Downturn. sort of the recession hit. Mm-hmm. And so we, we actually um, did, we put it out of business because we couldn't compete at that moment. But we've capped our group insurance program for maybe three decades. And that's been one thing. Taxes are another thing that the city of New York is very, uh, has a very enlightened policy, which is it provides partial or full tax abatement on affordable housing. Uh, so when we help create these co-ops, one of the things they get as part of their ongoing affordability is affordable taxes. And it, it lasts for 40 years. And hopefully we're, we're in the point where we need to start seeing the renewal of that 40-year um, abatement for many of our co-ops. And hopefully that will will be successful. And you're right, it, uh, taxes alone in some of the gentrifying neighborhoods would really make it unaffordable. So it's an important consideration to keep it. And, and then it's the co-op's obligation to keep it affordable generation to generation. So you said that the city of New York, uh, they have helped us with this 40-year. I want to give a shout-out to Anita Bonds, who's a council member here in the district, and she created a limited equity task force, which you were so kind enough to come down and share your wisdom and knowledge and experience to. And I was on that task force as the property manager member of the task force. And one of our recommendations is pretty much the first one, because before when here in the district, if you became a limited equity co-op, you only had five years of abatement, not 40. And we have asked in our recommendations is that that would be a life as long as they're a limited equity co-op then they don't have to pay property taxes because it what we have shown really clearly is as property taxes go up you've really got to increase your carrying charges and more often than not the members there because affordable and aging in place they have a fixed income and they cannot keep doing this and so you'll just drive them out of housing just because the property taxes nothing else right and I think it's a, a a good financial deal for the city because the abated property taxes are far less expensive than creating another affordable unit or recreating all those affordable units that would become unaffordable. So it's a good for the city. So you have 1,300 limited equity co-ops? Correct. So in the city, when we did this, we only had 99. Okay, we had, let's say 100. You have 1,300 limited equity co-ops. And we would, we had talked about how we can get more here. But, but let, let's talk about why limited equity co-ops. What are the benefits of that you found for co-ops and particularly for limited equity housing co-ops? Well, I mean, it sort of goes along with, with UAB's philosophy, which is, which is you know, the, the folks who live in a neighborhood, it's their neighborhood where their lives are it's where they were born they go to school they get married they have their jobs very often they have a a, a real interest and will participate given the opportunity in rebuilding you know knitting up the the torn fabric of that neighborhood i don't think we ever considered the the neighborhoods as sort of wastelands that should be bulldozed as they did in urban renewal days these were places these where people's lives were and given the opportunity, given the resources, they would rebuild them. And the way that that works best is when they own it, they control it, 
They make decisions, you know, about how it's going to be. They have a vision of what they're building and, and they work towards that. And that's, that becomes the co-op. And so that's, you know, why we do co-ops. You know, when you study them, you'll find less crimes and less drugs in those co-ops and in the, and then in the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, people are more satisfied with their housing and when they own it and control it. They, over time, become less expensive to operate than, than other housing. And it just, in almost every measure, it just works. And then there's all the other benefits of the community of working together, of having a support group right there with you of, you know. I, I also, over the years, was involved in community gardening through a group called the Green Gorillas. And, you know, so Green you go gorillas. to the same neighborhood and you go out into this vacant rubble-strewn lot and who do you see? Well, it was the same people who two weeks earlier were sitting in one of our co-op training classes. That people who get involved sort of get involved, you know, and so they they are fixing up their neighborhood. We also know that folks in co-ops, at least in New York, vote more than other people in their neighborhoods. And so that they, they participate. So you're getting to me the co-op principles, and the first one is that if it's operating as a co-op and don't just have it in their name, that co-ops are open for everybody. It doesn't make any difference about gender, education, religion, politics. It, it just doesn't make any difference. Race, no, nah, doesn't make any It's open for anybody who wants to be involved. And then the second principle is democratic control, one member, one vote. And I have it because that's in the fabric and the DNA of a co-op. Then you find out that co-op members will go out and vote in the general elections, okay? Because they learn of the importance of voting in the in the co-op, and so you get this higher voting. Uh, I lived in Puerto Rico, and there's a lot of co-ops in Puerto Rico. I didn't realize this, but come voting time, I mean, it was. The whole world seemed to have erupted in Puerto Rico around voting time because there was so much interest in it and so much going on. And I have it. I didn't have it at the time because I didn't know about co-ops. That that's likely because there were so many co-ops starting in elementary school all the way through. So, yeah, that's one of the benefits of co-ops. Less crimes, less expensive. They own it. They control it. They make the decisions and visions. Why aren't there more throughout the U.S.? Like you guys have been doing it in New York. but There are a lot of co-ops in New York. They do make up a significant section, but across the nation. As I heard from my co-op elders when I first started in this world, going to NAHC meetings and uh, National Co-op Business Association meetings and things, that co-ops are the best kept secret. It just is hard to... Uh, get the word out there because there's so much countervailing forces that want to do rental housing or own your own home, own your own single family home. Um, although there are single family co-ops communities. So, so that is possible. I, I just think it's, it's out of the, the mainstream, although people are, are aware of co-ops and they're part of co-ops. They're part of their credit unions, rural electric co-ops. Uh, agriculture co-ops have 100 million or more members. So there's lots of Americans who know about co-ops. So I had the same conversation with, at the National Association of Housing Co-ops in AHC from the elders, Herb Fisher and Roger Wilcox. <laughs> they set me down and they taught me about co-ops and the benefits. And they call it the best kept secret. This radio show came out of those conversations to try to get people to understand more, the everyday person to understand more about co-ops and the work that you have been doing and other people like you. And Roger was very involved in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in creating co-ops and bitter when it when he stopped being able to make it, when there was no more HUD money or federal monies to do it. But we'll be right back to talk more to Andrew White, Riker about his experience in New York and creating 1,300 housing co-ops and all of the good that's happened in these communities. We'll be right back. Mm-hmm. 
Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. We have Mr. Andy Riker on with us this morning from New York. Andy, I have it that there are four different types of co-ops, and you mentioned a few of them, and that depends on who owns and controls the business. If it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker co-op. If it's owned and controlled by the people that use the products and services, it's a, a consumer co-op and housing co-ops are only controlled by the people that uses the housing. It's a consumer co-op, credit unions, food co-ops, health clinics. You mentioned the rural electric co-ops, it's consumer co-ops. And then if it's um, come together to buy things that they need, it's called a purchasing co-op. And if a group of people or, or businesses come together to market their products, that's it's called a marketing pro, uh, co-op. And, Farmers have created Cabot Creamery, Land O'Lakes, Ocean Spray as some examples of marketing co-ops. And sometimes these are called producer co-ops because they produce and they add value. They take the milk and they, they make other things out of it like cheese and yogurt and so forth. So these are the four types of co-ops. And as you said, there are just millions of people that belong to co-ops. But too often, if they're a consumer co-op, a credit union, or rural elected, they don't even know they're in a co-op. And that was my experience before I started managing housing co-ops. I might be a, I was a member of a credit union. I did not know it was a co-op. So that's always been curious to me of why it's the best kept secret. You mentioned that. And that's what I was told by those seniors. Best kept secret. But why is it a best kept secret? I don't know. I mean, I think I'm as, as, as confused by that as, as you are, but you know, it has been a best kept secret, but in recent years, in current generation, in the current economy, I think people are learning that it's different. And I think some of these businesses, you know, or, or co-ops are learning how important it is to educate. I was really pleased a number of years ago after being a member of REI, Recreational Equipment, uh, a six million member co-op, that they finally started talking about co-ops. They actually now have a co-op brand within their, within their, their things. But it took, you know, decades of my membership and it started way before me, before they started doing it. But it's the time. Co-ops have a resurgence. People are interested in co-ops. So I think now is the time that the food co-ops and the rural electrics can speak up. The credit unions can talk about we're a co-op and this is what we believe in because, you know, the aspirations in the past about the economy, I'm going to, I'm going to do well. I'm going to get, you know, my home. I'm going to build my wealth. It's all going to be fine. Well, there's alternative routes through that economy and co-ops are one of them. And for many people, many, many people, uh, the economy hasn't worked for them. And the co-op economy is sort of that the quickest route that you would find on your ways um, when you're getting there. This is it's the route that you might not have taken if you were just looking at the map, but it's the one that that that's a little more circuitous, but it actually gets you uh, to where you want to go. So we've seen after doing some national work, uh, this resurgence of interest in co-ops. Um, and we hear about the housing co-ops from coast to coast, from north to south, People are calling us and say, we want to figure out how to do a co-op in Oakland, in Seattle, in the Washington state, in, uh, you know, Portland, Maine. Um, we're working with uh, some groups to do a co-op there. The city is an important part of it. And, you know, in the midst of all of that doing, a credit union shows up and said, we want to be part of this. You know, it wasn't like you had to reach out to them. They said, these are our folks. This is our issue. Uh, we want to be part of this. So so um, we're seeing that happen and seeing that there is this renewed interest and uh, in, in co-ops. And so I'm hoping that we can see it through to completion where we'll have active co-op practitioners who are helping start new co-ops in all these locations and co-ops are getting together different kinds of co-ops and working with each other to to build the co-op model as a way to solve and and get people engaged and successful in in this economy so this is a question that i've been toying with for the last mm, 20 years why aren't there more co-ops and it came about with 
is the best kept secret. And Roger Wilcox, who has since passed on, I think he was 97 when he died uh, several years ago. And uh, Herb Fisher, who's in his 90s now, um, they kept telling me that. And so I, I kept looking, why? Why? Particularly when it's so good. All the benefits you talked about. And there was a study, I don't know if you saw it, where it compared HUD-funded apartment buildings, affordable housing, with HUD-funded co-ops. And the co-ops outperformed the apartment buildings in every aspect, except for one, the rich people didn't make money. <laughs> okay. So if you were rich and you wanted to have an apartment building, you did not have that opportunity within the co-op. Because if there was anything to be earned, then that was earned by the membership. But every variable, and you mentioned all, you mentioned a bunch of those. Over time, less carrying charge, less crime, better social community. The people learned how to vote. The people learned how to work with their police. They learned how to work with their city council. Some of the members in the co-op became on the board. They came out, ran for the city council, ran for the board of education. Every every angle, people save more money. If, so why aren't there more? I kept asking that question. Why aren't there more co-ops? Why don't people know about them? Why aren't there more co-ops? And I came up with, there's this, you already mentioned it. I call it the giant John Wayne thing is pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. And I go, how do you do that when you have no boots? Okay. And too many people in those red line ghettos did not own their boots, so they couldn't pick themselves up. And as we've seen with different communities like Tulsa, if you got ahead, too often you were torn down. And then uh, through Citizen United, I got two two answers. Citizen United says that the rich people can buy politicians and then politicians get in. They are for the people, but for the rich people, they make policies that help the rich. Okay, and that's for all of the, the HUD money goes to help the rich to have the affordable housing, to have the apartment building so they can make more and more money and not for every day. And that, that to me was the answer. I was told it on, on air one time that I was cynical. But I also heard in one of the meetings that the folks like the credit unions during the McCarthy days did not want to say they were a co-op because they were considered socialist or communist organization. So they had to put a muzzle on really saying, because it's not that. There's no way that it's a communist organization. So now it's okay to say we are a co-op. And I'm hoping, that, like you said, with REI and with credit unions, and maybe with the rural electrics, they can come out and really brand this co-op world. That's what I'm hopeful. What do you think about all of that? I think that's true. I mean, it's true there aren't more co-ops. In fact, there are less, at least limited equity co-ops, which we found in the, in the heyday of the HUD programs. Over 300,000 units got built. Half of them have paid off their mortgages and no longer are restricted. But... um you know, I just think it's a matter of, of you know, putting some successful examples on the ground of, of folks like you in this program and elsewhere, really showing those examples as, as being successful, of really um, talking about them being permanent solutions that a co-op, once it's built, as long as it's running well, passes from generation to generation providing some return on equity, some wealth, but also passing on the affordability to the next generation. That doesn't happen with, uh, with you know, uh, developer-built rental housing. It serves one generation, and there's no guarantee it will still be affordable 20 years from now. So that's important. You know, most of the federal programs were focused on making the private sector work better. They weren't about building public housing or or subsidizing something. They were ta talking about the private sector, construction industry, the developers. So that's where the focus was. Hopefully we can change the focus in this administration, in this economy, where so many people feel it's not working for them. Well, here's a way where it can work for you. And hopefully we'll get some real examples on the ground. We'll get some programs that are really working. And maybe our elected officials will realize that more than 100 million 
Americans are members of co-ops. And we need to start talking about that. It's the largest interest group in the United States when you put it all together. And I think we really need to, uh, you know, we need to somehow let the secret out and tell people. But it starts with each co-op educating their own members. Yes. I, I have it about 130 million Americans are members of co-ops. There you in go. a University of Wisconsin study they did four or five years ago, it talked about membership being more like 350 memberships in the co-ops, and there's only 330 or so. It's more memberships in co-ops than you, the population of the U.S., but that's because a lot of folks like me and maybe you, if you're, if you're an REI, I live in a housing co-op, I uh, um, belong to a credit union, I joined the Federation of Southern Co-ops, uh, I've joined several food co-ops, so I'm a member probably of seven co-ops. And so on average, though, uh, each individual that's a member of a co-op is, is a member of three co-ops. And if you take some of these farm families, they may be a member of seven, eight, nine, ten co-ops. When you look at the, all of the different portions of that, so a hundred, I have it. One hundred thirty million Americans are cooperators. Too often, if they're in REI, um, a rural electric co-op, a housing co-op, a credit union, they don't even know that all of the benefits and that it is a co-op and the benefits of being a co-op. So, yes, getting those entities, those consumer co-ops to brand this cooperative is, I think, one of the critical things we need to do for America so Americans will know about this. What can we do there? How can how can we get those groups to really push co-ops? I think that, you know, they all do some sort of education but it needs to be out front, you know. They need to fly the co-op flag. They need to have a dot co-op email address they, and website. They need to have the co-op story, you know, right right on the the page where people pay their bill, whether it's in print or online. All those things, you know. I just think people need to understand what they are, and then they need to talk about all their other kinds of co-ops, you know hearing about a housing co-op or a food store co-op when you're seeing your rural electric bill might be of interest. You know, it'd be interesting to hear hearing about an urban co-op or a rural co-op if you live in the opposite place. All those would, would intrigue people. And and talking about their benefits, how it's going to, you know, make make their children's lives easier as they as they become adults and try to raise their families. And, and so forth. So I, I don't know, other than doing our job of telling the story, something that you do every week. And I would like to do it every day, but okay, that's another conversation. So we have volunteer and open membership as the first principle, democratic member control. We talked about those two. Then there's member economic participation. They have to put something in, in a housing limited equity co-op. Often that's just the same thing as a one month security deposit. Could be very low. Autonomy and independence is the fourth, and we're going to take our next break now. Uh, we talked about education, training, and information is the fifth, and there's two more we'll talk about as soon as we come off the break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Vernon Oak. Um, you know, the National Co-op Bank has been sponsoring this program Andy, this is almost eight years. October will be eight years. And October is also the month that we celebrate a co-op month in, in the U.S. And it is my birthday, and it's the anniversary of this program. So October is huge for me. And I will get to see you at the induction of the Hall of Fame this year. It's going to be on October 7th, which is my birthday. So you'll be inducted the same day I was born. But I'm going to talk about the sixth principle. You already mentioned it and maybe didn't know it. When you talked about Maine, one, a city in Maine and the city is helping to create a housing co-op. And then a credit union came and said they wanted to be a part of it. And that's cooperation among co-ops. And if we get this ecosystem where the housing co-ops buy from REI or they buy from the food co-op, and the food co-op will go get members in the housing co-ops and the credit unions, and we get this 
synergy working back and forth is one way of building this and people knowing about co-ops. And you mentioned that the rural electric could send out messages about the credit union in their neighborhood or the food co-op in their neighborhood or the housing co-ops. I think there's 900 rural electric co-ops that electrified rural America in the 30s and 40s. And Roosevelt administration loaned them the money and they paid it all back. It's been a great investment of tax dollars. And then the seventh one is concern for community, and you said that's what you have does is build community, and that's in the DNA of co-ops is building this community. So those are the seven principles, and when a co-op works, it's working with those principles, but I like the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. I have it caring for one another, which is a golden rule. That to me is, that is what cooperation is. Any comments about that? Well, right. I, I think that once people are in a co-op and they feel safe and secure in that community, that is sort of the definition of a community. And I think it's something that people really treasure about their co-ops, although sometimes only after they've lost it. Mm. But it's uh, it, it's an important part about a, a co-op, and um, it, it's really an important part about their success. And it's something that, you know, all those, all the things that come out of that, all the social capital that gets built, all of the good results of, for kids and for seniors and for people seeking jobs and, and people getting on with their lives, um, all those things that, that we sort of are, are seeing are a natural part of a, a co-op working right are often things that government, through a variety of social programs, try to create in addition to creating housing. And so it's sort of, when you do a co-op, in many ways, you get all of it. It's, it's more work to develop a co-op. It's more work to manage a co-op. I'm sure, as you know, attending those meetings, is, they're long and arduous. There are many, many meetings. I always wondered whether in some language cooperative means many meetings. Uh, but uh, anyways, but, it, but in the end, I think you get far more uh, for what you invest in a co-op than you do if you try to create the housing and make it affordable and run it well and, and create social programs and create these education programs, create all those other supports you need to create and have programs and so forth in a co-op somehow embodies them all. That's what makes a co-op so satisfying to work with. It just, it, it sort of ticks so many of the boxes that you want with something that you work on that's successful, um, which makes it such a pleasure to work in this area. So all of those meetings, particularly a lot of times they're night meetings, that, that would be the what would cause the pro- property managers to, to want the ones that worked or the assistant property managers that they would end up leaving because it just took a lot of time and effort and virtual has made it better. And um, we try to get day meetings for our, for our workers, for um, people who worked in a property management business. But when you saw the results, okay, it just made it all worthwhile. All of those meetings, all of that time, getting people to learn how to, there's going to be conflict by definition, and getting people to learn how to resolve those conflicts uh, through conversations and conversations and conversations with causes of meetings, that, those results are just phenomenal to watch it work when you can sit back and watch it work. So, yeah, that's one of the big benefits of co-ops. But when you start limited equity by definition means that you don't make much money. The people that live there, they don't, get all of the capital as things go up in value. So what has been your experience about this limited equity and creating wealth? I just think that it works better. You know, it's a difficult thing because in many ways being able to, you know, cash in on a on a property that was, you know, something you bought that was not worth much at all when you bought it. And now the neighborhood is, is come up, it's improved, it's gentrified, the values are enormous. Why shouldn't you be able to cash in? But no matter how much you get, one, you only get it 
generally at the end of your life or when you retire or whatever goes on to your children. Whereas in a limited equity co-op, you get it every day. You're paying half or a third of what the market rates are, uh, monthly charges, the rents in the neighboring apartments. You're getting all these other sort of non-monetary value and you're putting money in your pocket every month instead of having to wait to the end to to get it. And so you have it to start a business or to help your kids go to college or uh, to buy a second home if that's what you want or to, you know, go go back to school yourself and, and get a new career. All those things are possible when you have stable, affordable housing and you have some extra money in your pocket because your monthly charges are lower than they might otherwise be if you were in rental housing. So I just think it, it makes sense. And, you know, there is a low buy-in price and you get a reasonable return. I mean, you can't get 3% or 2.5% or whatever on your investment in a bank. Currently, you'd have to go out in the market. You might be able to do that, but that requires a lot of risk and care. So that you are getting a return. On the other hand, there's another generation, and very often it's our children and our grandchildren who are in that generation. So that, you know, you either can work on the rising prices and speculation and hope that you do well enough that they can afford it, or you try to build a world where things are reasonably priced and people, uh, especially when they're starting out, are able to find something affordable to move into. So that's what I think is important. Well, Andy, when I first heard this term limited equity co-op, being a black American, I thought it was white folks not wanting blacks to get capital. And I didn't like them. Okay, I thought it was you and other people of your complexion just didn't want blacks to, to make it. Was I wrong? Um, I was so I, wrong. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it, but it is something that that makes me a little uncomfortable talking about it. But on the other hand, it works so well that I mean, maybe that's partly why it's it's a secret. I don't know. Here's what I found out. Limited equity co-ops, the people that get there, like you said, there's a low down payment. It's the same as security and going into an apartment. And most people that end up in the limited equity co-op cannot go out and buy a house or buy a condo. So their only option is an apartment building or the limited equity co-op. And the limited equity co-op is so much better. And all the things you just talked about, so much better than the apartment. You have community, social wealth. You end up, one study said it's 7.1% return, and it's a property in, in Atlanta, as opposed to one5 to 2% per return you talked about on that down payment. But you also, you get a lower carrying charge. And in Atlanta, it was it was two, it was like a 40% reduction in what they would have to pay for an apartment down the street. But you get this community and one lady told me that the best return she could ever get was she was able to raise three children there in a safe, secure environment. And that's what was good for her. As opposed to the other option was in an apartment building, perhaps in a bad neighborhood. So this limited equity co-op is superb. It's A++++ plus 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 in my mind now. And, it, and for people like you that are doing this, I take my hat off to you. Like I said, you're my hero. I only have about a minute left. What would you like to leave people with, sir? You know, like a cooperative, like we talked about, this work is impossible. You I mean, you're giving me a lot of credit. But in fact, it's a lot of people. It's it's the the elders who I met, Roger and, and Herb and everybody else when I first started who taught me. But it's also the staff that you have, 25, 30 folks who have been doing this work who actually go out to those meetings evenings after evening or now Zoom after Zoom and do all the work. Uh, I'm only uh, there as now the executive director for the past 40 years, but uh, it takes a lot of people and there's a lot of people who made all of this possible and particularly the people who live in the buildings. It is a self-help effort. They do it and they are the ones who also deserve most of the credit because they do most of the work. Andy, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for your lifelong work and the numbers of people that you have worked with and supported. Thank you so very much, sir. 
and, and thank you for telling the secret okay. every week. <laughs> okay. Okay. Everybody out there, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. <laughs>